Today on The Global African, we'll talk to Palestinian activist and journalist Maj Kael about his trip to the United States and the importance of making the connection with the African-American struggle. We'll also talk about the trial of former Chadian dictator Hisseini Habre. That's today on The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. Global African has this great opportunity to interview Maj Kyle, the media coordinator for Adala, which in Arabic means justice. It's a human rights organization in Israel and the Palestinian occupied territories. He's here in the United States for a very intriguing reason, to build solidarity with African Americans. This is not simply a symbolic action. There have been decades of efforts of building solidarity between our two freedom struggles. In this episode of The Global African, we're going to explore that relationship. We're joined in the studios today by Maj Kayal. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So what brought you to the United States? Well, mainly the similarities, the strong similarities between the two cases of African Americans and the Arab citizens of Israel. When I think of Ferguson, I think of Michael Brown. I cannot not to remember my cousin that was killed by the police because he was protesting uh, uh, political uh, events. And I cannot ignore the strong attach, the strong similarities between us, between the two, these two struggles. But I, I can think of three levels. The first level is to show solidarity, to express the understanding and the sharing of the pain of the people who suffer of discrimination and uh, uh, and racism it's it's very important for us to say that we know this feeling and we know what what the black people in america are suffering because in the end of the day our struggle is motivated by feelings by the human sense of justice and not only out of political decisions and political uh, motivation, but we, we start from the human point. We start from the human rights point. And the second thing is a message to, our, to my community, to my people, that we cannot struggle against racism with counter-racism. We cannot think about ourselves only as Palestinians and only as Arab, and that's why we are struggling. We are struggling we are starting our struggle from the point of human rights and global values, universal values of human rights, of freedom, of equality, of, of democracy. And this is very important. This connection that we are making, not only with the African Americans, but, but with a lot of people around the world that are struggling their causes. This is a very important message for us to say that we are part of this universal movement for rights. And the third thing, not only on the level of values, but on the level of practice, to learn. This is the most important thing, to learn the tactics, to learn the method of work, to, to learn about ourselves and how we can improve our struggle, how we can support each other. This is the three main things that is motivating my visit. Prior to the program, we were talking about a lot of things. And one of the things that I found fascinating was our discussion about uh, in addition to similarities between the Palestinian and African American situation, but particular similarities between Palestinians and Native Americans. Yeah. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I think that we are the native people of Palestine. We are the, the obstacle that the Zionist movement had when they moved from Europe to Palestine in order to establish their state, their colonial project. So we were, the, we, we are considered in the Zionist literature as, as the obstacle that they need to get rid of. And this is what happened in 1948. In 1948, the majority of the Palestinian people was colonized. 530 villages was destroyed completely and their people became refugees in the Arab world. 70%, 75% of the Palestinian people today are refugees, Palestinian. Palestinians inside uh, in Palestine before 48, they were 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. After the Nakba, remained only around 100,000 uh, uh, 100, 
people that we are today, the Palestinians, known that Palestinian citizens of Israel, that we are today 1.2 million. We are 20 percent uh, of the Israeli citizens. Mm -hmm. And but we are still considered by the Israeli authority as the threat, as the demographic threat for the Jewish majority, because the main target about people, Palestinians within Israel. Yes, we are a Palestinian people that remained in Israel right. after the, the catastrophe, the Nakba, which which is the base of the establishment of the Israeli state. We remained and we took we first of all, we stayed under military uh, govern until the 60s. And then they gave us like citizenship. We became a citizen. But the question is, what kind of citizens mm -hmm. citizenship? So we are in a place that we are considered also uh, always by the state as the enemies. Why? Because they, we are threatening the basic ideology of the Israeli state it's key, that it's keeping a Jewish majority. The main target for the Zionist movement and for the Israeli state is to keep a Jewish majority in Palestine. We are a problem. We are not Jewish. Mm -hmm. So that's why the police brutality that is very similar mm -hmm. come from the place that th they see us as a protesters or as normal people that can be meet, met in the street. They, they see us and consider us as enemies. Here it started and not only the police brutality. I think that the police violence reflects the violence that you have. We suffer every day in different, uh, uh, in different aspects of life, in education, in workplaces, in in, uh, uh, in uh, landing, in housing, in all the aspects of life that are full of violence, full of oppression in everything. And the police brutality is the most, uh, the most, let's say, brutal and the most clear image for that. But violence and oppression are found in our daily life in everything. You know, the, um, every, every so often, but increasingly, we're hearing Israeli politicians suggest the removal of Palestinians, not just from the occupied territories, but from within Israel itself and the removal to Jordan. I mean, is this rhetoric or I mean, is this their objective? I think this is their objective. Whenever they say that the main target is to keep a Jewish majority, this is what they are saying. Clearly. Now, this is the this is the main problem about settler colonialists, how they think. They think that people are objects, that they can move, they can kill, they can uh, displace, uh, displace them from here and concentrate them in those cities. They don't look at us as humans that has connection to the land, connection to the history, connection to the language, to the space that we are living in. They look, they see us as an object that they're only in the, in the context of their political needs and political uh, uh, interest. For example, they have, we have the case of Imm al-Hiran. Imm al-Hiran is, is a small village in the, in the Naqab area, which is in the south of Israel, Palestine. And this village, it has a demolish order. 2,000 people, all of their houses are has, uh, having a demolishing order. Why? Because they want to build a Jewish town on its roots. They want to clear the, Jew, uh, the, the Palestinian, the Arab village and build a Jewish town on it. Why? Because they want, because they can, because they have a message of who is the master of this land? Mm. Who is the master here? Who give the orders here? And if you look at it, you will find that it's big of a part of big project of connecting the settl settlements in the West Bank uh, and Hebron especially to the area of the Naqab, which is in the south of Israel, which is which says clearly that there is nothing called Palestine and Israel. It's all our territory. It's all our place. And here, this connection that that is made b b between the West Bank and inside Israel is it's important because it shows that the problem is not only the occupation in, 60, in the 67 territories, but it's more, uh, it's more substantial. It's more about values. It's more about a regime that is, is based on a racist point of view against the native people that are living here. Let me ask you one final question. 
What is your message to African Americans about the situation facing Palestinians? What's the one or two things that you most want African Americans to appreciate about the Palestinian situation? I think, first of all, I, I think that it's, I want, okay. Um, the most important thing here is the understanding that our struggles, even if it's far away of each other, are connected, are mm -hmm. deeply connected in one structure of ideas, which is the values of human rights, democracy, freedom, and equality. This is the most important thing for me. But second, it's important to understand the Palestinian problem, not as a problem of territories and borders, but a problem of struggle against a racist regime, against a, race, as against a regime that is built on the idea of supremacy. Mm -hmm. And the solidarity of the victims, the solidarity of the people who suffer the oppression, this is for itself its important value in any struggle against any oppression in the world. Maj Khal, thank, thank you, you very much for joining us for The Global African. Thank you. Take care. And thanks very much for joining us for this segment of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher, and we'll be back in a moment, so don't go anywhere. Former leader of Chad, Hussein Habre, is currently facing trial for crimes against humanity during his reign as president of that Central African nation. Habre has been referred to as Africa's Pinochet, drawing from the name Augusto Pinochet, the longtime dictator of Chile. Much like Pinochet, his brutal reign was supported by the United States government. During his leadership, it was reported that some 40,000 people had either died or mysteriously disappeared. Additionally, there were many reported accounts of torture under his watch. In 1990, Habre fled an uprising and went into exile in Senegal. His official trial, however, began in 2013, but there were numerous delays due to his unwillingness to appear. Now, thousands of Chadians seek justice for his wrongdoings as court proceedings are underway. We're now joined by Reed Brody from Human Rights Watch, an attorney by training. He, before joining Human Rights Watch, he led United Nations teams in investigating massacres in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and El Salvador. His work has been profiled in the New York Times, Al Jazeera, and the Wall Street Journal, among others. Thank you very much for joining us on The Global African. You're quite welcome. So we wanted to talk about this trial of Hisseni Habre, uh, but it might be useful to just do a little bit of background on Chad as a Central African country and, and what the struggle, uh, how is it that we find ourselves today with this trial of, of Habre? Hisseni Habre was the dictator of Chad from 1982 to 1990. Uh, he was brought into power uh, by the Ronald Reagan administration uh, which saw him as a bulwark against Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Chad's northern neighbor, um, who had expansionist designs uh, on Chad. And, and in fact, just as Reagan was taking office, the uh, president, then president of Chad, Gukuni Wedi, had signed a, a merger agreement with um, Gaddafi. Uh, and the United States saw uh, Libya as its main enemy uh, in, in, the, in the region. And according to, uh, according to the reporter Bob Woodward, uh, the United States supported Habre as a way to bloody Gaddafi's nose. And the United States saw Habre as the anti-Gaddafi. He was a warlord at the time. He had come to uh, he'd come to international prominence by kidnapping uh, the French anthropologist Françoise Claustre, holding her for three years, uh, killing the, uh, the French negotiator who had come to uh, try for her release. Um, but the United States bet on Hissen Habre, uh, and with uh, secret arms uh, shipped by the Reagan administration, ultimately with the support of France as well, uh, Hissen Habre came into power in 1982. Um, he continued to fight against the Libyans uh, who were occupying the north of the country. Um, and with U.S. and French support, Habre defeated the Libyans decisively. Um, 
but at the same time, he turned his country um, into a, a police state. Um, he's alleged to have committed thousands of political killings, systematic torture. He had an archipelago of political prisons. Um, he had a police called the DDS, um, which were his, it was like his personal uh, Gestapo, um, which had, which was directly reported to him, uh, which was called his eyes and ears around the country and thousands of Chadians um, were put into DDS prisons. Um, Habre was finally overthrown in 1990 um, by the current president, Idris Deby, who 25 years later is still the president of Chad. Um, and um, Habre fled to uh, eventually to Senegal, which is where he lives today and where he's being tried. Um, was this a popular uprising or was this a falling out among thieves? Uh, it was it was a bit of both. Um, Idris Deby had been Hissen Habre's military chief earlier on uh, during one of the more bloody periods of the repression in Chad called Black September, um, but then was uh, had been basically exiled and then brought back as an advisor. But he and two of the other Zahawa tribe leaders who were Part of Habre's coalition broke off with Habre uh, for reasons that are not totally clear um, and started a rebellion. His and Habre, as he did in previous such instances, then carried out an ethnic campaign against members of the Sahawa ethnic group and, and entire villages were burned. Um, hundreds uh, of Sahawa leaders were, were imprisoned. We, in the in the DDS documents I described, we have lists of uh, Zagawa, the Zagawa traders in our prisons. Um, uh, finally, in December December first, nineteen ninety, Idris Deby's troops enter Chad, and the prison gates come open. Um, so um, it it was kind of I mean it was it was uh, I mean it was an armed fight to to mm -hmm. bring Habre. Uh, uh, to justice. So uh, Habre ends up in Senegal. Uh, how is it that he ends up in trial? Well, what happened is um, in his victims, and, and a number of his victims wanted to bring him to justice. Um, but, uh, and, and the new, it seemed like the new government was going to offer, as D Idris Deby said, um, was, didn't come to offer gold, but to offer liberty. Um, but that soon changed, and, and uh, the Truth Commission that had been set up uh, found its, its, uh, its work uh, ignored, um, and the Victims Association basically went into hibernation. In 1998, when the Chilean general Augusto Pinochet was arrested in London mm -hmm. on charges by a Spanish judge about alleged crimes committed 20 years earlier in Chile. Uh, and the British House of Lords ruled that Pinochet was not immune from arrest anywhere in the world, despite his status as a former head of state. Uh, the human rights movement was in effervescence and people around the world started thinking, well, maybe we can bring our, uh, you know, former torturers, tyrants to justice. And we were, Human Rights Watch was contacted by Chadian Human Rights Group uh, to ask if we could help the Chadian victims uh, in bringing Hissen Habre to justice in his exile in Senegal. And we began working with them. I began working with his victims 16 years ago, actually 1999. Um, and we put together a coalition of Chadian and Senegalese uh, activists and lawyers, and we helped them file the first case against Habre in Senegal. And Habre was actually arrested in Senegal 15 years ago uh, before the uh, go government of the then president of Senegal, Abdoulaye Wad, basically toyed with the victim's hopes for 12 years. Uh, he, he had the case thrown out of court. Uh, he then promised to uh, extradite Habre to Belgium, wh wh where the victims had sought justice. Um, he then promised the African Union that he would 
prosecute Habre in Senegal. Um, nothing happened until 2012, when in the course of a couple of months, the International Court of Justice, the World Court in The Hague, um, ordered Senegal to either extradite or prosecute uh, Hiss and Habre according to their legal obligations. And uh, at the same time, a new president of Senegal, Macky Sall, was elected and said that he was going to organize the trial of Hiss and Habre in Senegal. So it's been a long struggle for the victims um, who have been in Senegal, in Belgium, and in, in the African Union, in Addis, in, in the United Nations, and um, have really, really fought for, for 15 years to create the political conditions um, for the trial that's going on now to take place. And what are the ramifications of this trial twofold? One, for the rest of the continent, but the other is within Chad itself. I mean, you mentioned that Habre's successor, as a result of the overthrow, has been in office for 25 years. What are people in Chad saying? That's a very good question. Um, you know, I think there are many ramifications. The first, on a basic level, is here we have one of the rare times in the world, a group of survivors who have fought and who have been the architects of uh, their, their winning campaign to bring Habre to justice. And that, I think, is very attractive in the same way that Pinochet's victims were inspired, mm -hmm. uh, had inspired his and Habre's victims. Um, right now, we are getting requests from all over Africa and the world. The victims' leaders have been invited to Togo, um, to, 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 to Zimbabwe, to uh, Gambia, to Rwanda, um, to talk about their experiences. And, and hopefully others will say, well, wait a second, these people actually achieve justice. Um, it also comes in the context, of course, of this tug of war between the African Union and the International Criminal Court over Kenya, over Sudan. And this is an opportunity to show that African courts can actually provide justice um, for crimes allegedly committed in Africa. In Chad, I think it sends a very powerful message to the man who's in charge now, Idris Deby, um, you know, that there are limits and that, and, and for somebody who has ruled in, a, in an authoritarian way for 25 years, the idea that activists have brought to justice your predecessor um, is a very subversive um, idea. And, and there's a big, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in the background here um, with the Chadian government. I mean, Idris Deby, the current president, was Habre's military chief mm -hmm. during a particularly bloody period. At the same time, his, many of his members of his family were our victims, and one of them is going to testify. Um, uh, when Habre went after the Zahawas. And at the same time, you have this other f factor that, you know, it's, if you're an authoritarian, the idea that your predecessor has been brought to justice um, by, you know, human rights groups and victims groups is, 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 is quite threatening, I think. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending this time with us on The Global African. Thank you very, quite, very much. You're quite welcome. And thank you very much for joining us for this episode of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher, and we'll see you next time.